And I will, before we get started, let's uh, let's have a, a word of prayer and then we'll and dive right into it. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, we just uh, pray, God, that as uh, we come even before you today, Lord God, that you will teach us uh, through your word, Lord God. I pray that everything that we do, everything that we say, Lord, let it be for your glory. And we just thank you, Lord God, for, uh, for what you're doing in this church, what you're doing among your people. Oh, God, continue working, Lord. Continue doing the amazing, awesome things that you do, Lord God. And Lord, you be all glory, praise, and honor forever. Amen. Hey, howdy. Have to see everybody. <laughs> oh man, yeah. I've heard this song before. This is, this is one of mine. I really like this song. This is um, Continuous Praise. God, I delight in your promise. And walk on the path of the righteous. Lord, you shine this heart of mine. Down in the soul, there's a melody. Moves to the rhythm of your wrong beat. Bless your name again and again. When I'm caught up in your presence, oh God. Beats start dancing and they just won't stop ever second. Sing a little song about you, it's free. And if I shut my mouth, rocks and sing out. In the summer, in the winter, in the fall, in the spring, I lifted my voice and let down the This little light of Gonna blaze on and on and on in his praise. All right, so the chorus goes every second, every minute, every hour, every day. Sing a little song about your goodness and grace. Because if I shut my mouth, then the rocks will. So in the summer, in the winter, in the fall, or in the spring, I lifted my voice. Let the hallelujahs ring. Because this little light of mine is going to blaze. On and on in continuous praise. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day. I sing a little song about your goodness and your grace. But if I shut my mouth, rocks will sing out. In the summer, in the winter, in the fall, or in the spring, I lift up my voice and let the houses scream. But this little light of mine is gonna blaze on and on and on in the spring. When we praise the Lord, hallelujah. Praise Him what? Constantly, continuously. Every second, every minute, every hour, every day. I sing a little song about your goodness and your grace. Because if I shut my mouth, rocks will sing out. In the summer, in the winter, in the fall, or in the spring. Lift up my voice and let the house be But this little light of mine.
Don't stop, Lord. We just keep on praising. You know, when I was watching TV just yeah. a little bit ago, I, I, you know, I swear I see the guy on a horse go by my house. On second street. Nice. And it's like, <laughs> I looked out the window and I thought, what? I actually ran out to the street. <laughs> Nobody else seen it, right? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> else. Somebody else. Could you have a totally happen. Does anyone have a testimony by chance? Anyone other than see horses? No. No. <laughs> All right. I was thinking, should I say anything? There we go. All right. We're going to sing one last song and then we'll get going to our Bible study. All right. <laughs> The splendor of a king, clothed in majesty, all the earth rejoice, let all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness drives him by, trembles at his voice. Trembles at his voice. How great is our God? Sing with me. How great is our God? I'll see how great, how great is our God. Sing it for us again. How great is our God? Sing with me.
All right, well, if no one has a testimony, we're just going to dive right in. I think that was pretty neat about hearing about a horse, I'll tell you that. Especially in town, you don't see a lot of them. <laughs> Some guy riding a horse through town. It's kind of cool. I don't sell any picture. Yeah. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> All right. Well, today I've got, uh, uh, we're going to uh, share God's word again. And uh, we talked about the uh, last week, we talked about uh, the, 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 uh, the seven realities, right? Which was God is always at work around you. God pursues a continual love relationship with you that is real and personal. And God invites you to become involved with him in his work. God speaks by the Holy Spirit through Bible, prayer circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith and action. You must make major adjustments in your life to join God in what he's doing. And then also you come to know God by experience as you obey him and he accomplishes his work through you. So we're going to go on to chapter six, which is God is at work around you. And so before we get started, let's, let's uh, ask God to uh, bless the anointed word today. Father God, I thank you for your word, Lord God. Your word is life. Your word is truth. We pray, Lord God, that you will open our eyes so we see the truth in your word, Lord. You reveal that to us through the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord God, you open our ears so we hear what you are saying to us. And open our hearts to receive that wisdom and instruction of your word to our lives. God, we thank you for your word. We love your word. We cherish your word, Lord God. We hold it in high regard. And we thank you, Lord. Now, as we sit at your feet, we ask that you would just teach us, Lord, the things that are good and that we need to know for, uh, uh, for uh, Lord, um, for life and also, God, for instruction. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. You know, we need to pray these things. Amen. So uh, today we're going we're gonna to discuss about how God is at work around you. Now, there's a few things that that um, I, will, I will be sharing tonight and stuff uh, that well, can. Yo. Um, I learned to speak up when the Lord tells me to, and I have a very short testimony. Speak. You have to do it in front of. Yes, me. because we need to see you. <laughs> By all means. You want you can send us to it was just when you said and then Christ will bring you you come to a crisis yeah faith and belief amen um when I came to the Lord I was living um with the man that became my husband and I took this experience in God um course cool. and um led me step by step through it and I came to that point where God was saying he said, you have to leave him. And I told him I would never do that. And he said, but you're not married to him. You haven't, you know, in my eyes, you haven't stood before me and married to him. So it was really difficult and it didn't happen overnight because I fought it and fought it. And, and then of course, you know, um, Garth and I were fighting too. It was not a healthy place. And then one day it just blew up and God just said, no. And I went to Jennifer's <laughs> and she put me up and eventually I got an apartment and um, uh, we were apart for six months. Um, we even came to the pastor, Pastor Bridal was the pastor at that time, came to him. And he, um, we spoke with him, um, we went for counseling and um, Garth ended up asking me to marry him. And he had no intention of ever getting married again. And so, that's what the crisis of belief that I had to trust. And um, it wasn't perfect. You know, after all that, it wasn't perfect, but it was much better than it ever had been. 
and he would then was no longer resentful of me coming to church because it was like it was he was so resentful of any time I spent here and I can't say he ever sat in here except maybe on a Christmas Eve or something but he was always over in the kitchen whenever there was something going on and he was always helping that way or helping with repairs to the church and and that kind of thing so in in his way you know he was able to um, build his relationship with the Lord and I am living a very comfortable life right now because of the pension that he was was transferred to me when he died and, and um you know i yeah i know what the other side is so it's just about double what my income would be from the government so it's made me very comfortable and able to share and volunteer and keep the car running and donate and give offerings and yeah and it's all to that crisis of belief so anyway, Amen. that's great. Yeah, because I, God told me to speak once before and I didn't. And so I told him I would. And I'm sorry. To hey, no, not at all. <laughs> I, I, I always stand aside with the Lord. The Lord speaks out of night. Yeah, oh, amen. That's great. Praise God. Thank you. That's wonderful. It's a great, that's a good testimony. Yeah, that does. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to uh, share uh, today about God is at work around you. One of the things that I want to show and I want to point out to you tonight is, as we talk about this is, is what is God's work, okay? God, you have to understand something. And I'm, and I'm going to point this out through scripture, but I'm, I'm just going to just, just dip into just a little bit if I will, okay? God is obsessed. I mean, you understand this, okay? With redeeming the lost. That is his primary focus, Okay. When you look at the word of God, you've got three chapters where it's a wonderful, sinless world. And then everything that follows that is the work of redemption. And God has been, because God wants to redeem everyone. And I'll, I'll go into to more details in, in a little bit on this. And you understand, this is what God's work is. This is what God... This is his desire, his focus. This is what you might say, you know, this drives him. This is the thing that God wants, is he wants to redeem all of human back to himself again, okay? And, and so uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss a little bit about that. I'll even take you back in time, and we'll look at that and then what, God, uh, what, what God's plan was and what, what, he, what he was wanting and so forth, okay? All right, so here's the thing, if there's anything, uh, it, it sums it up, a lot of it is in John chapter 5, verse 17, uh, then off to 19 through 20. It says this, my father is still working, and I am working also. I assure you, this is an important point, I assure you, okay, this is like making up an extreme point here. The son is not able to do anything on his own but only what he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, the son also does these things in the same way. For the father loves the son and shows him everything he is doing. Okay, so you have to understand that when, when Jesus is, is talking here and he's saying, this is what drives God, but this is also what drives me, okay? Jesus came for the whole purpose. You have to understand that when, when it comes to the, the Trinity, right? The Trinity always was. We, we somehow get the idea, okay? That there was God, right? And then Christ was born, and then there was Jesus, and then later, later on, then there was the Holy Spirit, and, and then the Holy Spirit, you know, then he shows up, right? It's not that way at all. They always were all together at the same time, yet one ever since the time of creation. When it says that God was was uh, moving upon the face over the face of the waters, all three were present at that time, and then so you know you need to understand that it's hard for our finite mind to grasp this. Yes. So last night I was looking into uh, the denominations of Christianity because I was curious. I saw it on the marriage license, wondering what that was. So there's Pentecostal, whatever, whatever. Right. And so I saw something about the Holy Trinity that was there's the three entities and then another separate one. Can you, do you know what I'm talking about? They're not exactly a, a separate one. It's there's all of them. One. Yeah, God is okay. one and yet three. Okay. Okay. 
The best way to explain it, and I, I break it down for people, is to understand this. There's God the Father. Yeah. Okay, you read in the Bible, God the Father, when he shows up, there's always a what? How many people don't, right? There's fire. There's wind. There's rumbling. The voice of many waters and like trumpets. When uh, in Exodus, when uh, God wants to show up on the mountain to talk to his people, the people are terrified. God comes on the mountain, there's smoke, there's fire, everything. And he says, and the people all tell Moses, you go talk to him. We're not going to go. We're terrified. Man, this is something else, you know. And so Moses says, fine, I'll go. Okay, That is God the Father, okay. We don't know, honestly, we don't know how big he is. We don't know how big God is. God is eternal. God, you know, always was and he always will be. He always is, right? And so. So this is God, and you can't look at him because if you do, you'll die, okay? I mean, that is God, okay? God is so holy that our bodies could not, you know, begin to even comprehend him, okay? Even the angels uh, that are in heaven, which are heavenly beings that are created by God, shield their faces with their wings when they are in the throne room ministering uh, to God. So that's understand. That's God the Father. Now, how I, how I always say it is this, Jesus is also God, but he's the form of God you can look at and not die. So, yeah, and you see, because when there, there, there's, there, there's God and then and Jesus, and we got to understand that, you know, God and Jesus are one. So when Jesus came down, there are many things that if you look in the Bible, you don't know, mind, I'll just go into a couple of them. Jesus forgave sin. Only God can do that. So that says, you know, Jesus is God. Jesus spoke to the water, the winds, and the waves and said, peace be still. Creation recognizes the voice of the creator. Okay? And also, Jesus said he was God. He actually says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Well, yeah. This spoke to me. Um, yep. I read it many times before it spoke to me. It's in Genesis 1. And I have, I've got something wrong with my eyes from surgery, so I don't know what to say this first. That's okay. It's um, one, I'm pretty sure. Genesis, here, is it 26? It's fine. And then God said, let us make yes. man in our image. Uh, and that exactly. blew me away when I yep. really got that. Yep. I've read that how many times, you know? Yep. So I just want to point that out. Mm -hmm. And so when so when Jesus was on the earth, how many? Let me ask you a question, okay? I, I, I'm, I'm, how many people you know know the life of Christ? Why did they crucify Jesus? Why? Because he said he was God. Exactly. <laughs> he said he was God, and that was the highest level of blasphemy. Okay, that is why they put him on the cross. Okay. The the other part is. They needed the Romans to do it. That's where the king of the Jews part came in. They needed him to be like this, uh, you know, uh, the, the, to start the, this riot, insurrection kind of thing. And then they needed the Romans because the Jews at that time could not put anyone to death like that. Only the Romans could. So they needed a hook to get the Romans to do it for them. Okay. And so that's where the king of the Jews part comes up again. But, you know, Jesus part was king. But it was because Jesus said, I'm God. That's right. Because he even tells Philip, because Philip says, show us the Father. And then Jesus, the one of his disciples, Philip says, Philip, don't you believe I am the Father of one? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He says, in other words, I don't need to show you the Father. I am the Father, <laughs> right? I mean, you know what I mean? He's saying, I am God. Right here, man, you know? And so it, it, it's very uh, 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 interesting. Now, the way I describe, okay, so you got God, God the Father, right? God is awesome, mighty, you know, you know, uh, it, 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 terrible, you know, there's the you know, fear of God, all that. And then there, there's Jesus, which is in human form, and he, like I said, he's, he's, you, you can look upon him and understand all the love and stuff of Christ and, and not God, okay? And uh, also, uh, all the love and everything, you know, that, that God, because Jesus is God, is all in Christ, okay? And also, it was the means of redemption so that he could redeem um, humans. Okay, then the, then the next one is the Holy Spirit. Now, his ministry is different 
Now it's still, it's God, but it's the God that can be in you. See, Jesus, when he came on the earth, he can only get so close, just like you and I would be going, I mean, you know, we've got flesh and bone, bone blocking it. You know, I can't get inside you, okay? But when the Holy Spirit came, that is Christ in you. That is God in you, okay? And so, and then, and then, uh, and, and that is, uh, you know, the, the tools that he gives us and stuff for, for ministry at, as well. And so when you have, see, I got to tell you, uh, Old Testament people would love to trade places with you because they could never have the Holy Spirit in them. And we have that witness. You have a direct communication to God. You can hear directly because God is in you through the Holy Spirit. And that's what is very important. And, you know, and, and you understand that there's a lot of these new age teachings going on, you know, that's saying like, you are God, right? It's different though. You have God in you working his will through your hands, okay? And working his will and what he wants to accomplish just as he did with, you know, I am uh, in the sun and the sun is in me. As he did that, God is able to have that kind of intimate relationship with you. So he's able to, as, as Jesus did, you're able to do through the Holy Spirit, okay? And you have that real intimate, that uh, the part where, like I said, where God, where, you know, he's actually in you, okay, to, to uh, communicate with you. And so uh, that's amazing when you think about it. It just, it blows my mind, okay? So it's like, you know, God says, I really had this awesome relationship with Jesus, and I want to have it with you. And then so when he sends the Holy Spirit, we're able to do what Jesus did and the things he was able to accomplish and to do the will of God because of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so uh, I want to go on to give an example here. So it talks about uh, in a California in, uh, inner city church, they were uh, a small congregation. They were an older congregation, and they were running out of steam. They were dwindling down, this congregation was. And so they finally came to this realization, we don't have enough to keep the lights on anymore. We just can't do it as a church. So they were thinking, we are going to disband the church. And so while they were making plans to do that, they said, let's take the Experiencing God course. And so they did. They took the Experiencing God course. And as they started taking the Experiencing God course, they started asking, God, where are you working? Show us where you're working. And so in this church in California, one day they get a call and it's from the lady that's in this apartment and she comes over and she goes, we really have a lot of kids in our apartment complex who come after school and they got nothing. They got no activities. A lot of them are latchkey kids. Man, it would be really nice if someone would do something for these kids. So this uh, California, this, this church said, you know what? We're going to close our doors in a couple months. But I tell you what we'll do. Uh, we will put together a program and we will do something for these kids. So they did. They provided a ministry. And as they provided this ministry uh, for uh, latchkey kids, um, unwed mothers, uh, you know, single mothers, right? And, and all these other people started getting involved. And before you know it, there were other people, uh, you know, uh, gang members. And people started coming to Christ through this because of, of, their, of their obedience. And when people started coming to Christ, then they started uh, uh, realizing, wow, we got something happening here. So they're starting to reach out to their community. They're more effective in what they're doing. And now people are coming in and getting saved. So by the time those couple months are up, they're not going to close their doors. Now they have new life in their church and a new purpose. So now they are able to go out and start uh, uh, ministry and really uh, see where God is working and join in where, where God's working. And so I, I, one of the things I want to encourage you and challenge you is ask God, where is he working? God, where are you working? When God speaks to you, and it gives you an invitation. When, if, for instance, if someone comes up to you and says, man, I, I, I got a question. I, I don't, I was reading this in the Bible the other day, but I don't really know. You know, can you tell me more about Jesus? That's God working. And now that's your invitation to jump into where he's working. Okay. 
So uh, when you, when uh, the thing is, it's important to keep your eyes open and to see where God is working, okay? I'll give you an example. Um, for me, for instance, I didn't expect, okay? But um, I got a call to be a, a chaplain for the jail. That is where God is working, okay? So uh, right now I'm making the process and I'm doing you know, security clearance and everything. And then I'll be, we'll be ministering to people in the jail. That's where God's working. And so that's the invitation I got to be a part of that. So I see that there's going to be fruit and God's working and we're, we're going to see things unfolding as time goes on and we're going to see more fruit and stuff coming from this, yeah, from this ministry. Exactly. Right? And so again, that's where God's working. When you say you want to know, you're like, God, you know, what do we do? You seek the Lord and, and pray God is going to show you where he's working. Because God, remember, God did not wind the world up. Right? And then set it down, and then he watches it from a distance and lets it do its own thing. God is involved in every part of, of our lives and also throughout all of time. God is in, but God, as, as God works through you and shows you these things and reveals these things to you, so you have a deeper, intimate relationship with Him. So He's done over all these years, the people that we see in the Bible and so forth. And as we go on, we, we know about you know, other heroes, right? Uh, you know, D.L. Moody, right? You know, Charles Spurgeon, all these other people, you know, uh, Catherine Kuhlman, all these, you know, those people that, that were in, you know, that, that were in ministry and God has been intimately involved in every part of their life as well, okay? And so uh, you have to understand that when, so when God is, is working and he invites you to be a part of it, that is how he develops a relationship with you as well. Because God is always about you and he wants you to be excited about what he's excited about right god's his his primary purpose is the redemption of human god so he wants you to be excited about it too we hear that song right what was it amy grant i believe saying it right uh, like like my father's eyes right on my father's eyes to see things like god see what, what god wants you to see is his compassion and love that he has for the humans that he created he wants you to see that as like he sees it. He wants you to get fired up about it, okay? If any of you have ever, ever hung out with, um, I mean, I'm not many of you fish, right? If you hang out all day long with a fisherman, a fisherman is going to say, here's my technique. This is what I do. This is the bait I use. We're going to go there. We get the depth finder. Ooh, there's muskies here. I could tell. This is my spot. So you go there, you're right. You, you get that boat up there, and he's going to say, and if you do something, and you'll be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't, don't touch the bait like that. You do it like this. And then so a lot of times if you don't know how to do it, right? I mean, I, I mean well, I'm, I'm not picking on, 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 on women, but I've seen women are like, ooh, word, no way. Ooh. So then, you know, the, 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 the guy, right, the fisherman will say, no, nope. you put the worm on like this, thread it through the hook, and he's right there with you, guiding you through, okay? And then, and then throughout this whole thing, you're like, you know what? I, I kind of like fishing. And, he, when, and when you get a bite, he's like, oh, no, no, no. The fish is just playing with you. It's not serious yet. And then, and then when, when they finally, you know, and you, you see if, you, if you're uh, trolling with a boat, you'll, it, it's different than, you know, when you get a snag or when you get a fish. And then you'll be like, pull it. And then, you know, reel. And he shows you how to do all these different things. And you get the and boat get up there and you get the net underneath them. Sometimes maybe one will get away. And you'll be like, oh, shoot wasn't, you know, because when the boat goes too fast, the fish can't get the lure. I've seen those sometimes where it just gets on the edge of their lips. It was really weird. One time I pulled a fish in and I was like, I caught him by his lips. <laughs> but anyway, and it was, when, I, when, I was, when I was younger, we used to fish the Missouri River. And so anyway, so we, we knew, ah, so the boat down so that the fish can catch up to the lure. And so uh, when, when the fisherman shows you all this, He's instilling this in you, and you're going, man, I really like fishing, right? That's why God uses those kind of illustrations, shepherd, fishing, those kind of things. Because the Lord is showing you, I want you working with me. I want, see, it's say together. The old ways of fishing were you cast a net out, and then together you would pull in the net. It would take more than one person to do it. 
and you were together. That's why there was Peter, James, John, and you know, he had all of them, and Peter had his brothers out there because they were all part of the fishing, including Zebedee, right? That was a dad. And he was, so they would all haul in these nets. So they would go to where fish would be, throw a net out, cast it. Then as they would do, they'd grab these ropes and, they would, uh, they would, and it was called hauling the net. And they would pull these ropes and it would pull the net down and it was like a scoop. And then it would come up. And then as they would pull up, there'd be all kinds of fish in it. Maybe there'd be an octopus or a squid in there too. But you know, you know they would and sort it out and then go with all the good fish and all the bad fish. Well, this became a, a really awesome illustration. And Jesus is like, that's exactly what we're doing. So when they would use this net and they would pull up all, all these fish, this was a together activity. And that's why God used the illustration of fishing. He wants you to know, I'm there with you. We're all together pulling this net of all the people that are lost and need Christ. So when we're all pulling it together, we're all doing this together. So God is intimately involved in all this. And so that's why he uses, you know, these kinds of illustrations. So I, I want to I show you something that uh, uh, understanding uh, uh, more about um, who God is, okay? Because he's, although Jesus was God, right? He was also completely human and he never failed to do the Father's will. He was all about God's will. Why? Because God was all fired up about this and then and Jesus is all fired up about this. So then when the Holy Spirit comes into you, you get all fired up about it too because that is what, what God does, all right? Get you all fired up about basically, you know, winning the loss, the redemption of humankind, okay? So interesting uh, thing is, in, um, it says here, and I, I want to I wanna point out this uh, scripture because it's all about God carries out his redemptive plan, okay? So in Paul's letter to Corinth, he says this, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Look, new things have come. Now everything is from God who reconciled to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he committed the message of reconciliation to us. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. And that is in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 20. So you understand what he says here. Thank you. There's the reconciliation. He talks about the God wants to reconcile all people to himself. OK, so when God wants to do all that, then there's the ministry of reconciliation. See, God, as we become partners with Christ, we see where, where God is working. And also when we come to Christ, then God recruits us to be excited about what he wants to do, which is reconcile all mankind. OK, or human connections. All right. And so, you know, that's 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 really important. It says, so, so there's a few things in the model of, of, of what Jesus did is the father has been working all along. Now the father has me working. And it's, a, it's the same as the one, you know, when we get saved, right? Working all along. And now he has you working. Okay. So then this is what Jesus' model is. And then the father has me working. I do nothing on my own initiative. I watch to see what the father is doing. And I do what I see the father is doing. Okay. So that is really important. So what I want to do now is I want to um, explain a, a few things. When I was looking at reading the word of God today, there was, there was something you understand more about the heart of God. So I, I want you to understand this is what God wants to accomplish. Okay. This is what God wants to accomplish. Okay. First of all, as we know, in Genesis chapter 2, uh, God plants this wonderful garden that that is it, it, that is uh, toward the east in Eden, right? And we and we know all know about the Garden of Eden. Okay, so there, what He does is He, he first of all he, he forms man, right? And then He places man in the garden. Now it's interesting because He says He placed in a man whom He had formed out of the ground. The Lord caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. So I mean, there were not at this time. I want you to understand there were not. Thistles, briars, 
nasty looking ugly plants that smell and all that, right? Weeds, these were not in the garden yet. These were not in. This is a perfect garden. And then the Bible specifically says that it was pleasing to the sight. So everything looked pretty, okay? And everything was, was and then the food was even pleasing. It was all very yummy. So it, it says in there that the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? And then there was the river that flowed out of Eden to the, wa to the water of the garden, to water the garden. So God had this beautiful system set up where it was divided, it became four rivers. Now, jumping to 15, it says the Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden, cultivate it, and keep it. See, I, I want you to understand, first of all, remember when I talked about the God who doesn't miss a beat? Adam doesn't just sit in the garden bored. God has something for him to do. You take care of the garden, okay? So, I mean, uh, you know, when I, when I, when I, uh, you know, when I tell people about it, it's like, you know, uh, people that need to understand, it's like, you know, that a work ethic doesn't come just from us. This is, this is mandated by God. This is God's work ethic. God put, you know, by the way, he put, he put uh, a man in the garden to take care of it. You know, and so obviously the garden needed some tending. Needed, you had uh, leaves and, and, you know, that, that uh, needed pruning and things like that. And so it was very interesting. So he had this thing. Now, also, it says this too. The Lord commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden, you can freely eat, but of the knowledge of good and evil, you will not eat for the day that you eat it, you'll die. And then the Lord said, it is so not good to be a man to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. So while uh, he's thinking about this, right, out of the ground, the Lord formed every beast of the field, every bird of the sky, and brought them to the man to see he would tell them. So all of these animals all come around and gather, and, you know, to Adam. And God wants to see what he'll name them, right? And, you know, and the thing is, you have to understand that we, we, at this time, you know, uh, we get this idea in our head that Adam's like, okay, man, right? He'll run, dog, cat, moose, uh, ooh, smell bad, puke, skunk. No, Adam was incredibly intelligent. And he understood all of God's creation. He had to with harmony with God. And so he named them according to, you know, as he saw. And the Bible says that whatever he named them, that's what God said. That is their name. Okay. So uh, when, when uh, um, yeah, whatever living creature, right, was what came up there, you know, to, to Adam, he gave them names to all the cattle, birds, and the sky, and every beast of the field. And, you know, he named them all. So then, as we know, okay, um, Adam, uh, uh, from his rib, came uh, a woman. And so you notice that DNA is similar, but there are some changes. And the thing is, is because it comes from Adam, right? I mean, it's directly removed, right, from uh, man. What I think is interesting is God did not take the bone out of Adam's skull. He didn't take the bone out of his backside or out of his toe or whatever. He took off the cell which is, it's your emotions, it's your guts, it's your feelings. And that's how it was uh, back then. Everything was always, if your bowels were moved, you were really emotional. And that's how it was. So when, when the rib was, was taken, that's side. That's side by side, right? And that's what God intended when he took that, that rib. And it says from that, he formed a woman and then brought him to it. Now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, this is, this is what, what, what I find very interesting. Again, he explains about the whole, about the, you know, the, 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 uh, the fruit. And, and it says this, it says, listen very carefully on this, stuff, okay? The Lord God commanded, uh, the man he's talking, and of course, you know, he tells a lot of stuff. Uh, the Lord God commanded saying, from any tree of the garden, you may eat freely. Okay, any garden. Except... From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat for in the day you do your God. He did not understand there are two trees in the garden, two major trees, right? He did not say you can't eat of the tree of life. If, if Adam or and, and if they both would have not listened to the serpent and would have eaten of the tree of life, they'd have lived forever. We would all be immortal right now, okay? We'd all be living forever, okay? And but the thing is, is then, then the, the serpent came and, 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 and beguiled and, and uh, 
was able to con them into eating of the wrong tree. So when this happens, it, there's a few things that I, I find very interesting about God. And, and so interesting thing is this. Once they eat of the, of the wrong one, because, you know, they see, oh, wow, you know, that this, this uh, is going to help us to know good and evil. And that's exactly what they did. They knew good and evil. Okay. And their eyes and their eyes were open and they realized that there was shame and all these other things that came along with good and evil. So interesting thing on this is this in verse eight, it said they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Now, now the Lord here, here the thing is, is this God doesn't, he's not micromanaging, right? I imagine that when God came in the cool of the day, it would be like, Adam, how was your day? What happened? Right? And Adam would say, oh, you got to see this. I, I saw this most awesome flower the other day. God, your creation is so amazing. And then they would share that together. Okay? And here is, when we get this idea, we see even in, in the children's books, when God comes walking in the cool of the day, right? You see these little tiny Adam and Eve, and then big massive God, as he comes walking in the cool of the day, he's like a big old giant, right? And he comes walking in the cool of the day, oh no, what's going on? Ah, yeah, no, that isn't it. I, I gotta tell you, uh, uh, folks, uh, uh, my understanding in this is this, when, you know, when God says the Lord God comes walking in the cool of the day, I, I really think that it was, and this is my, my opinion, but if you're really close with someone, you'd be like them. And my opinion is, is be, before Christ, this was a type of Christ. Okay, this was Jesus walking along the path. Okay? The reason why I say that is because this is, is, is very, very key. Because in the Bible, uh, there is the tree of life. And it's all about, if you, okay, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. See, God's original plan, okay, was... You want Adam and Eve to eat of the tree of life, to have eternal life. Because if you're going to hang out with an eternal God, you need to live forever. It's as simple as that. And that's what God wanted. God wanted to, uh, he wanted all of humankind to be with him, to live forever as he lives forever. God is, he does, you know, he, he has no end. And so he wanted us to do that as well, because we are, you know, the, the, the treasure part of, of his creation. And so you have to understand that is the love of God. God wants us to be with him uh, forever. And so when all of this, you know, goes haywire, okay, and then uh, Jesus, I, I believe, that they call it maybe a type of Christ or whatever, who was already walking with Adam, he was very much involved and he was throughout all these hundreds of years be like, do you remember God, when we walked in the cool of the garden. And you know, in the time when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane, I'm sure his mind went back to that. After I do this, then humankind will be redeemed, restored, reconciled back to the Father. And once again, and they will live forever that because of, of, of the work that I do, and once again, they'll walk in the cool garden together. And, and so when, when, when all this is, is happening, there, you have to understand that we get three chapters, right? When it's a sinless world. But then when you see afterwards, it's all about redemption after that turn. And the thing is, is this, in the end, God is going to restore his original plan. Because we all talk, you know, you know about it, right? If you look in the very end, in Revelation, it says what? There will be new heavens and new earth. There will be a sinless heaven and a sinless earth, okay? And that is what's going to happen. It's going to be restored. So you have to understand, as part of the fall, okay, when you go outside and there's mosquitoes biting on you, I mean, think about it, right? Adam and Eve weren't wearing any clothes at the time. They would have been fair game for mosquitoes. I'm saying, I mean, mosquitoes are in my head. But uh, there were no kind of insects like that in the garden. There were no stinging bugs. There were no biting insects. 
there was there was no moth that grows. Okay, you know you didn't have moths that would eat your your you know your your cloth and bugs and ants get into your food and all that. It didn't happen. Okay, that came as a part of the fall, along with the weeds, to make it very difficult as a part of the curse. Okay, and so when when uh, when all this happens. See, I want you to understand too, just how destructive sin is. Sin is very destructive. And it's interesting because I've heard some theologians talk that when sin entered the earth, uh, that it was so effective, it moved the earth over on its axis. So now it got cold and it got to be unpleasant. Before in the Garden of Eden, I, it was the perfect temperature. I, I, I really believe that, absolutely. God created this absolute perfect world that he wanted us to enjoy. But when sin entered the world, it really ruins things. And so when, when sin enters into our life, it is very ugly. And, and you know, it costs blood to, to, you know, to be able to uh, redeem us back to God. And so what I find interesting in all of this is this is what drives God. So if you want to get to know God, you got to get, why do you think that it's, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, all these things, because God is showing us all as he works with us intimately. I want you to love the creation that has my breath as much as I do. And so by doing this, you're going to be a part of the plan of reconcil reconciliation and bringing all humankind back to me. And that's what God wants to do, God. And, and so that is the God's driving force when he does all these things. And, and so when you are, are part of that, he recruits you. He wants you to have that same driving determination. So, and I, I put it to you like this. You cannot love God if you don't love people. You have to love people because God is absolutely crazy about, I mean, that, that's, that's his creation, man. I mean, that's it. That is the pinnacle of his creation. Of his creation. That's us. We have the breath of God. In us. And so that's why when you see uh, people, you know, hurting, God says to do all these things because he says, be a part of my work and bringing people back to me. And so when you see God work, what's God going to be? God is going to be about redemption. So when someone asks you a question about, hey, what about, you know, this about God or that about God, or and you, you see, that's where you see God working. What is God doing? God is in the business. He's trying to redeem. He's bringing people uh, back to himself. And so when, um, when, you, when you see God working, the weirdest thing that we do, folks, is this. We do two things. One, we try to see what we can benefit from it. We don't need to benefit anything from it. If you are doing God's will, that alone is its own reward. We, right, we, we want, and then also, the second thing we do is when God tells us, when we see where he's working and stuff like that, we try to come up with a plan that's better. We want to help God out. We got something, oh God, this will work, but man, if we do this, Lord, this is going to be amazing. God already knows what he's doing. You will never outdream God. You will never have a bigger dream than he does. He is looking at that point of when everyone is in heaven, all tribes, all tongues, and everyone, you know, all together, and then they're worshiping and singing God, and then the time of the new heavens and the new earth, and, and, and that is what God is looking forward to. Okay, and so right now we are in this process of redemption. But the thing is, is this, folks, and you understand this, okay? That time is not going to last forever. Eventually, it's going to run out, and there will be a time when God is going to say, "Now all is ready." Okay, my children, it's time to come home. When that trumpet sounds, that's it. It's over. We go up to be heaven. Uh, but if your friend was arguing about whether or not God, God existed the other day, he gets left behind or she gets left behind. See, God is merciful 
and he offers all of this time. Folks, it has been centuries of God's mercy, and God has been doing all this because God wants as many people as he can bring, and he's trying to redeem as many as he can through Jesus Christ. And that's why he says time is short. He's moving us along as well so that we will be about the Father's business. When you look at Jesus, Jesus said, I must be about the Father's business. I need to be doing what God wants. God's greatest desire is to redeem humankind. Whenever, um, you know, we, we try, when, when we're growing up with, with our parents and stuff like that, we do things that make them happy, right? You know, if, for instance, if your, if your dad or whatever grew up on a farm, you'll say, hey, I made you, you know, that like in the old threshing crew, you know, the, the, the farmer's meal or something, right? You're going to do something that makes them happy and then say, because this is what really drives them, right? If you're a, a family, you know, if, 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 they, if they're fishermen, you're going to do something about fishing. If they're miners, you're going to do something about mining. But you want to please them and make them happy and remind them of, 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 of the happy, you know, times and, and the things that they really enjoy. You have to understand that this is what God is all about. So when you want to please the Father, if you are about doing his business and bring people in through Jesus Christ, because the Holy Spirit in you to do God's will, which is to reconcile human to himself, then that is what God is all about. And that's what we need to be all about. We need about so everything we do when we give a cold cup of cold water in Christ's name, oh, and we do all these things like that, you're showing the love of God. Why? Because just like those fish, the fish aren't going to go swimming, picking up speed, and then leap into the boat. And it can happen. You got to throw out that net, man, and pull them in. And, you know, and then, you know, you sort through, right? And you get, you know, got the good fish, and you're like, oh, that's a shoe. Oh, that's a weed. You know, oh, and then finally, hey, fish, right? And, and, and so, yeah, and that's what God wants us to do. And so we need to be about there. So when you do those acts of kindness, people are being beat up, abused in the world today. And when you do that act of kindness, you're extending the love of Jesus Christ. And you're doing the things that Jesus did so that you're bringing them in. And God's like, yes, yes, yes. Bring them in, bring them in, bring them in. He's excited about it. That's what excites God, because God, he wants, uh, you know, humankind to be reconciled back to him again. And then Paul even talked about the ministry of reconciliation. That's what we have, the ministry of reconciliation. This is what, it, 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 uh, is what you know, God is, is really excited about, with the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Exactly. And that's why we have the Holy Spirit. It's not just so we can speak in tongues and freak people out, right? It's not that. It's about the fact is that you are you have Christ in you. You're able to do the things that Jesus did. And I want you to know too that what you see in the Bible, if 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 God needs that to accomplish His purposes and His will, it will happen. Okay, there are a few things. Um, I will tell you this in 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 your journey. There are two things I tell people you never want to do, never want to do, uh, because I've experienced this myself. Number one, you never want to ask, because uh, when I was at Bible college, I thought this was so super spiritual. You never want to ask to have your spiritual eyes open so you see everything around you. You don't ever want to do that. <laughs> I, I did that, and I saw all kinds of creatures and things that were hanging around me, hanging around other people. It is incredibly nerving. I, I should, I'd say unnerving when you go and you're studying with someone in a cafeteria in college, and then you're sitting there talking with them, and then all of a sudden you see something pop up on their shoulder, connect to their head, like, and whisper something in their ear. And all of a sudden, the guy has an attitude, and he's like, "Yeah, what's your problem?" All that. And you're just like, "You see it all, right?" And so I saw these different things. Well, one interesting thing was again, uh, uh, my on my observations, I do not ever put a doctrine to this. But when I went outside and I looked up. There were thousands of angels, but it was weird because it was almost like they were linked. It was like, and then they were protecting the entire, it was a Bible college, so they were protecting the campus. But again, I see all these, you know, running all over the place, awful. 
And the weird thing is, is when you try to cover your eyes, you're like, I don't want to see it. You still see it. It's like you have 360 vision. It's, it's hard to describe, but it is really bizarre. And so, you know, when, when I was seeing things at night, you try to cover your eyes up with your blankets. It's useless. You still see them. <laughs> the weird thing is, is so the Lord, what the, I, I was sitting there and I was, you know, I was kind of re rebuking them and everything. <laughs> One thing is, is when I went back to my dorm, there were three of them that followed me. And, and I was like, Lord, uh, why are they, you know, why are these around me? Right. And the Lord said, well, those are yours. You want them there. This is this one, this is this one, this is this one. And I was like, yikes. And I was really heavily convicted. And I was like, okay. So God did me the absolute best favor of all. And he took away all that. So I didn't see all the, the, the spiritual world anymore. It was it's something else. And then the second thing you never want to do is this. Leanne is a, a witness to this one. You never, never want to ask God or ask Jesus the pain he feels over lost souls. I absolutely lost consciousness when I felt the pain. I, I just tell people, I know people say they want to feel the pain, but when I was pastoring a church, uh, the church had its own difficulties. I'm not going to go into it. But while I was, when I was preaching, Jesus came up on the platform and he, people were invited to come up and pray. And they didn't. They all went up their own way. And Jesus stood in the middle of the platform. He clenched his hands together and he looks up and he screams this blood curling scream. And it was just like the most agonizing scream you've ever heard. And in, in, the, uh, uh, in the vision, I went up to Jesus and I was like, what's wrong? And he said to me, do you remember those times when you were younger? And everyone would pick teams. And you didn't get picked. You were the one left out. And Jesus said to me, they don't want me on their team. And I sat with the Lord. And I said, Lord, when you feel the loss over all these churches that go their own way and they don't listen to you, and the, and the loss and lost souls, Lord, how does that feel? Let me feel that pain. And he put his hand on my shoulder, and I was absolutely in agony. I felt like all my best friends, everything I ever loved, died. I felt like the sorrow you can't imagine. I collapsed on the altar, and then people were wondering, and there were some kids and stuff that were, we were ministering to at the time, they were wondering why. I just wept to the very top of my lungs for hours and hours and hours. And I finally asked Jesus to take it away because I said, Lord, this is grief I can't bear. And he said, that's what I feel over the loss. That's the loss I feel. When the world is strays away from God, I thought my heart was going to stop. It was so painful. I just, I, I couldn't catch my breath. I just kept wailing and weeping and screaming and wailing and screaming. And it just wouldn't stop. It just kept coming. And I, I it was hard to breathe. You know, folks, we have no idea what God goes through. And the thing is, is this, that's why we need to be about the Lord's business. And we need to uh, you know, uh, be a part of that to reconcile people back to God so that people don't go off to eternal hell. Because you know what? Churches don't want to talk about it today. But I need to, but I want you to know, and those are also watching by video too, 
there's a right and there's a wrong. It was lovely just to say that there's all these different gray areas, but there isn't. There is there's a right and there's a wrong. And the word of God specifically points all that out. And if you continue to reject God, who made a way, you are literally sending yourself to hell. It's like if you're in the water drowning and someone throws you a life preserver and you're like, no, I don't want it. I'll swim myself. I can do it. You're all weighted down with all these chains and you're sinking lower and lower. And then they throw another rope to you and you keep throwing it away. And everyone's trying to rescue you and keep throwing it away. That is the picture that people are doing when they reject Jesus, when they reject God. And the thing is, our job is to do exactly what Jesus did. We need to keep throwing out that lifeline. We need to keep throwing out that life preserver. And that life preserver is Christ. So when, just like in the garden, Jesus became that tree of life that we can now eat from. We can now partake of that tree of life and have eternal life through Jesus Christ. And that's why it is important that we need to tell people about it because one day, folks, I mean, for us, it'll be wonderful. But one day that trumpet's gonna sound and the last second, is going to tip. And that's it. And when that happens, I mean, we, we've read all the, you know, uh, I'm sure you, you've read the uh, Left Behind books, but I don't want to be around when that happens. I'm telling you, there's uh, the, the Left Behind series, it's, it's nasty. Uh, there's a lot of bad stuff that's going to be happening. And, you know, instead of the one that comes to Christ, you know, as one escaping through the flames, right? You know, at the, the very end, you, you, you come to God or the one, you know, that, that, that just you know, comes to Christ in, in, in those last moments before, you know, the rapture. Instead of doing that, that's why, you know, we preach and tell people, man, you know, give your life to Christ now. Now, I tell you one for the younger ones too, give your life to Christ when you're young. Because then you can say, I look at it, I've got young I use all this strength and ability I can use for you, God. Right? And that's that, that's what that's what we need to be doing. You know, because the, the thing is, see, and I, I let people know this, once you become saved, then it's about good works. Okay. You want to be doing good works for God. Because when you get before the Lord, you don't want to come before him empty hand and say, Well, Lord, um, I kind of squandered it. Didn't really use town site that you gave me. I don't have anything to show for it. I didn't win anyone to Christ. I just won myself. You will be that one, you lazy servant. You know, how could you do that? And, and, and the interesting thing is, is when you look at that parable, it, it's like, if you have that kind of attitude, it's almost like, how can you say you love God? If you love God, you're going to be wanting to do what pleases him. And what pleases him is to reconcile things to himself. And that's, that's what the work he wants to do. He loves you. He's going to work through you. He's going to use you. And then by doing that, you're going to have this wonderful relationship with God. And he's going to be working with you. He's going to say, isn't this great? Are you starting to love people as much as I love them? This is awesome. And you're pulling in that net together. And then through that, you'll be like, wow, Lord, I really love, yeah, I, I, I love I love him as much as you do. And that's what God wants. And that's having God's heart. And that's what Jesus did. So I want to I want to ask you this um, as, uh, as we're, we're wrapping up because I see it's 810 here. Okay. I know this, you know, this one, like I said, you know, it may have not been, you know, uh, uh, mind blowing, but in a way, it's you have to understand this is the heart of God. If you want to understand who God is through his word, you have to understand what it is that is his passion. Okay, this is, and, and that is what it is. And so, you know, and by doing that, that's how it become like Jesus. When, when you look at Jesus' ministry on the earth, it was all about people. It always, right? I mean, everything from the feeding of 
the 5,000, everything was all that. And then, and, then you to, and then he had that new commandment, right? To love your neighbor and to love yourself, right? Because Jesus said, you want, I, want, I want you to have and understand my love. God loves you above others. Yeah. All right. So uh, I want to um, uh, end with this here. And that, and that is this. Um, oh, excuse me. One more. All right. So here's the thing. Um, Jesus says this, okay, John 7, 16, my teaching is not mine, but it comes from the one who sent me. When you lift up the son of man, then you will know that I am he and I do nothing on my own, but just as the father taught me, I say these things, okay? And then in uh, John, in the, in the 16th chapter, uh, Jesus goes on to say that, as the Father is in me and I am in you, I will send you the comforter, and then you will have that relationship as well. And then, you know, and then I will, will be in you, and then you will, you will, uh, you will know all things. In other words, you'll, you'll know the, the things of God, right? And you'll know uh, uh, God's word. And so, I, I want to I leave you with this. When you see someone seeking God or asking questions about Christianity, you are witnessing God at work. That is something only God does in people's lives. God will show you where he's working and you join in because when you do that, you are doing what God is doing and what he wants to do, okay? So interesting, it says here, if during the course, this is this is my challenge for you, I'm going to give you the same challenge that you should hear. If during the course of your day, someone asks you spiritual questions, okay, whatever else that you have planned, don't do it. Instead, cancel what you have planned and spend time with that individual to discover what God is doing. That week, Okay, and then it goes on and talks about, he says, that week our students went on campus and they saw God do amazing things and many people came to Christ. So my challenge to you, okay, over the week is this. When you go out, people ask you questions about God. That is, that, that's God at work. Take the time, spend time with, with, with that person and then see where it leads. See what God is doing, okay? Because right now I, I've got this, this new, I didn't, I, I, I didn't ask for it. This thing just kind of came to me. So it's going to be interesting to see what God has in mind through this chaplaincy ministry. So I'm, I'm pretty excited about it because it's interesting to see what God wants to do. He's got a plan. He's definitely at work in this and he wants, he wants something to happen and we'll all see what's going to happen. It's going to be real exciting. So, all right. Well, that being said, let's pray, shall we? Lord, I, I thank you, God, that you are working and you're always at work. I pray, Lord, that you will show us where you're working and how we can join you and we can be a part of what you're doing. Help us, Lord, to have your heart, your passion, your mind, oh God, and understanding, Lord God, and those things that you deem of value and important we pray, Lord God, that we will adapt that same value system to consider what is important, Lord God. And Lord, I just pray that as we go through this week, Lord, that you will set up those divine appointments and you will show us where you're working, Lord, and how we can be a part of what you're doing. Because that's what you're setting us up to do, Lord God. I know, God, that there is a movement coming, Lord. You are, you are coming soon. And so as you teach us and train us up, Lord, I pray, God, that we will be as excited uh, about uh, the ministry and uh, sharing your love, sharing, Lord, uh, you with others, Lord God. I pray, God, that becomes our excitement, Lord. And I pray, God, as, as you work with us and show us these things, help us to be obedient in all things, Lord God. Not to waste any time, but, Lord, to do exactly what you tell us to do and when you tell us to do it. 
We thank you, Lord God. We just, I just pray now, Lord God, that you will special blessing on everyone, Lord God, that is in this room. And God, that you uh, will uh, go with us, you guys, and protect us. And Lord, I pray, God, that we come back next week, Lord God, with a testimony about the things that you are doing. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for everyone for joining us today or tonight, I should say. And I'm going to be leaving now. So, bye, everybody.